At six, the future of social care in England. MPs prepare to vote on the Prime Minister's plans this evening. Boris Johnson insists his proposals will end a long-standing social injustice. Labour calls it daylight robbery. Also on the programme tonight. With fantastic uh, broadband. Uh... Raised eyebrows as the Prime Minister loses his way in front of business leaders in a speech about levelling up the UK. Forgive me. Bulb, the gas and electricity provider, goes into administration, affecting almost two million customers in the UK. A BBC investigation discovers that the deaths of two women who died of herpes days after giving birth in Kent are linked. And hundreds line the streets in Southend to pay tribute to the Conservative MP, Sir David Amos, who was stabbed to death last month. Coming up in Sports Day later in the hour on the BBC News Channel, back in the frame is Maurizio Pochettino, the long-term answer for Manchester United. And will he leave PSG mid-season? Good evening and welcome to the BBC News at six. The Prime Minister has defended his plans for reforming social care in England as MPs prepare to vote on his proposals tonight. Boris Johnson called his plan incredibly generous and said it would help tackle what he calls a long-standing social injustice over cost. The government unveiled its proposals in September, which include an £86,000 cap on personal care costs, but an amendment to the plan said support payments from councils will not count towards the cap. Charities have warned it will mean some of the less well-off will be unfairly hit. It's thought some backbench Tory MPs could rebel when they vote later. Here's our political editor, Laura Koonsberg. A mother's care for her daughter. Decades on, Roma's daughter helps care for her. The 83-year-old who has dementia had to sell the family home to pay for the full-time care she now needs. She worked night and day to have her own home. I mean, my mum would have been the Tory post girl. She never took a penny in benefits. She worked, she must have paid income tax for 50 years. And everything she worked for has gone because she's been ill. And, and that is just wrong. The Prime Minister claims the new system will protect families just like Lorraine's from enormous bills those who need intense care can face if they can afford to contribute. But there's a fear the wealthiest will benefit the most. If someone has a house worth £120,000, they'll still have to pay £86,000 themselves, even though they qualify for some council help. And they'd be left with just over a quarter of the value of their home. But look at this. If an individual has a house worth £500,000, they'll have to pay the £86,000, yet then will keep over 80% of the value of their house to pass on. The social care reforms... Some of Boris Johnson's own MPs fear his big platform plan for social care is unfair. And, uh, and... At a time when some wonder if Downing Street's really concentrating. Tony, yesterday I went, uh, as, as we all must, uh, 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 to, to Peppa Pig world. An appearance today won't have calmed those nerves or fears about the proposals which MPs will vote on tonight. They're much better uh, than the existing system uh, because under the existing system, uh, nobody gets any support if they have uh, assets of, uh, of £23,000 or more. Now uh, you get support if you have uh, £100,000 or, or less. But after losing his place, he was later asked... Frankly, is everything OK? I think that uh, I think that people uh, got the vast majority of the uh, of the points I wanted to make, and I thought uh, I thought it went over well. The social care plan follows years of governments to make changes, and overall, it should mean billions extra for care in England, with more people receiving help towards the cost. This former health secretary will back the reform, even with a heavy heart. It is very disappointing that the way the cap is going to be calculated is going to be changed. Um, which means that it's going to be a less progressive measure than was hoped for. 
The opposition is trying to persuade more Tories to join with them to reject the plan in the Commons later. We now learn that people will have to sell their homes, so it's another broken promise. Worse than that, it's that people who aren't so well off will have to sell their homes because, of course, many families won't have £86,000 to hand. The plans seem likely to pass the first hurdle in Parliament tonight, but Boris Johnson's claim that his plan will fix social care could well cause some political damage that needs fixing itself. Laura Koonsberg, BBC News, Westminster. Business leaders have been told that economic growth must be evenly spread around the UK rather than concentrated in southeast England. The boss of the CBI business group, Tony Danker, said that levelling up could not be left to the free market. Speaking at the CBI annual conference in South Shields, the Prime Minister said levelling up was still his moral mission and an economic imperative. From South Shields, here's our business editor, Simon Jack. Economic prosperity has not been shared equally over the last 40 years. The government has promised new Tory voters in the North that will change. And he came to the port of time to ask business leaders to help him do it. In the end, it is you, it is business people who will fix this problem. Unusually for a Conservative leader, Boris Johnson has never been that comfortable with a business audience. Uh. And at times today, he lost his thread and his usual swagger. Forgive me. Remember, this relationship has faced recent strains. This government has imposed tens of billions in new business taxes over the last year. How is that business friendly? If you ask me, does the Chancellor uh, want to, to go further and reduce burdens on taxpayers and, and business? Yes, of course he does. Uh, but don't forget, Simon, that we've just been through a, a pandemic. We will get to relieving more of the burdens on, uh, of taxation, but you've got to do it in a, in a, pr in a prudent and a, and a reasonable way. The conference was held over eight venues. In Birmingham, Keir Starmer tried to reset Labour's ties with business after the nationalisation plans of the Corbyn era. Sometimes, if I may say so, our party has um, come across as thinking that business is to be tolerated in some way, but not to be celebrated as a good in itself. And I think that um, mindset has changed under my leadership. The government's asking a lot of the private sector. It wants it to do the lion's share of levelling up and decarbonising, which is a tall order for firms emerging into a post-Covid, post-Brexit world and facing higher taxes on profits and wages. Little wonder then that that crucial business investment is still way down on where it was before the pandemic. Chris Ford was there to hear the Prime Minister's pitch. His family engineering business has been based near the port for over 100 years, but right now he remains cautious. I think smaller businesses uh, would like to invest, but are still uncertain when prices are rising across the board. So we're seeing material prices, raw material prices increase, labour costs and energy pricing going up across the board. So we're really you know, a little bit uncertain about where we're going, uh, so we're po possibly not quite ready to make those investments just yet. Leveling up will take a generation of investment in equipment and skills, but the younger generation is confident it can work here. Funding from the government into, into local companies would be advantageous, but I definitely don't think it's seen its day. The, the, the future's there. The North East is definitely going places. If Kelsey is to be proved right, business and government will need each other to make levelling up an economic reality rather than a political slogan. Simon Jack, BBC News, South Shields. Let's talk now to our political editor, Laura Koonsberg, in Westminster. So certainly some raised eyebrows about the Prime Minister's performance today. There were, Sophie, and of course everyone's entitled to a bad day at the office. But I think the danger for Downing Street right now is it's really looking like the Prime Minister is having a bad few weeks. Whether that is the you know, mechanics of what went wrong on the platform today, or more importantly, whether it's how the government handled a couple of weeks of allegations about sleaze, how they had a really serious backlash to their plans for rail last week, or the kind of criticisms they might get from their own camp on the Conservative benches over the social care plans tonight. And I think the reality is that people are inside the Tory party concerned about a lot of things at the moment. One ally of Boris Johnson, a former cabinet minister, said to me today of Downing Street, they just keep getting things wrong. And inside Downing Street, there are concerns about the atmosphere as well. This is, of course, still a government with an 80 seat majority. And Downing Street might say they're trying to do important and complicated reforms. And of course, there always are going to be bumps along the way. 
but it does seem right now, Sophie, that the Prime Minister's list of problems is getting longer and his party's confidence in his ability to fix them is going the other way. Laura Kunzberg, thank you. The energy company Bulb has become the largest casualty of the increase in wholesale gas prices, announcing its, to its 1.7 million customers that it's calling in administrators. Bill payers are advised not to take any action. They'll be contacted about any next steps required. Here's our consumer affairs correspondent, Coletta Smith. Bulb is the biggest green energy company. Bulb has been in trouble for a while. They admitted a few months ago that they were on the hunt for extra finance, but things have got worse, and now they've finally announced that the company will be put into administration. Bulb has more than one and a half million customers, which is way more than any of the other energy companies we've seen go bust over the last couple of months. So the regulator have decided that's simply too many customers to just pass on to another provider. And this time, they're going to do something different. An administrator is going to be appointed by the courts to run the company behind the scenes, but customers shouldn't see any change. They should keep paying their bills to Bulb, Bulb's staff will still be able to answer calls, and any credit is protected. But that doesn't mean customers aren't disappointed. I anticipate that at some point we will be bounced over to one of the big six, because that's what's left now, um, pretty much. And I'm not comfortable with that. I've had experience of dealing with some of the bigger players before, and I don't feel that their customer service is, is, is good at all. It's an administrator's job to root through the finances and decide what to do next, try to find a buyer or pass customers to other suppliers. None of the options will be easy in the current climate. We produce over 50% of our gas from our own sources, but we have to import almost 50% from Europe, and they're suffering the same sorts of supply and demand pressures as we are. When you break it down to the amount of profit that an energy company makes, it's, it's a few percent at most. And so if you have a temporary situation where you need some cash flow, to cover some extreme fluctuating costs. Of course, the smaller providers can't pick that up necessarily. Nearly four million customers have now seen their supplier topple this autumn. So there's even more pressure from the industry to get the price cap raised significantly next April. That would protect more providers, but hit customers hard again. Coletta Smith, BBC News in Leeds. Herpes is a common, usually mild virus. It is very rarely fatal. So the discovery that two women in Kent who had just given birth both died of herpes just weeks apart prompted our social affairs correspondent Michael Buchanan to investigate further. He discovered that both women had been given caesarean sections by the same surgeon in 2018. When he contacted their families this summer, they had no idea the deaths were linked. East Kent Hospitals Trust has said it cannot identify the source of the herpes infection and the surgeon had no history of the virus. These two women, both new mothers, died 44 days apart. Their families were led to believe their deaths were not linked until now. She was a real fun-loving girl, great personality, had lots and lots of friends. In May 2018, Kim Sampson gave birth to a son, her second child. She was a brilliant barber and an absolutely brilliant mummy. The 29-year-old had undergone an emergency caesarean delivery. The complications set in, the hospital didn't know why, and she died 10 days after giving birth. We had kept being told everything was going to be OK after she had that first operation, but from then it just... And then she had a further operation after that because she was bleeding out from lots of places. There was nothing really they could do with her. The Trust told the family that Kim had died of herpes, a common, usually mild infection that's rarely fatal, but they couldn't say how she'd been infected. They didn't really give us an explanation other than um, she may have come into close contact with someone who had a cold sore. Following Kim Sampson's death, the Trust say they told all maternity staff to take precautions against herpes infections, but just seven weeks later, another woman became similarly ill. They went on their honeymoon and I think she fell pregnant just after they got back. And she wanted a child? Oh, yeah, definitely. They'd, they'd always talked about having three children. <laughs> Samantha Mulcahy gave birth by caesarean section to her daughter in July 2018. The 32-year-old again quickly deteriorated, 
baffling medics and died eight days after giving birth. I can remember right at the very end, even then, they said they were basically at a loss. They didn't know what was wrong. The hospital said Samantha too had died of herpes, two rare deaths, but seemingly no link. We were told there was no connection at all with the death. But that turned out not to be the case. The trust quickly discovered the same surgeon had operated on both women. Documents we've seen show that just two weeks after the second death, they were told it does look like surgical contamination. Public Health England concluded the strain of the virus the women died of was rare and maybe epidemiologically linked. Well, these are certainly very unusual cases, very rare indeed. We shared the documents with Peter Greenhouse, a world-renowned expert on herpes infection. The only common source here would be the surgeon who performed the operations. But if you think of the speed at which these women became unwell and the location of their infection, which was inside the abdomen, it does seem very much more likely, very much more biologically plausible that that was the original site of the infection. Peter Greenhouse says the strongest likelihood is that the surgeon had a herpetic whitlow, a small, often unnoticeable sore on his finger, and that he unwittingly shed the herpes virus. Even though he was wearing surgical gloves, a study of caesarean sections found the gloves tear in more than 50% of operations, potentially allowing the virus to infect the women. We showed both families the experts' opinion. That was the original site of the infection. Does that make sense? a bit sick listening to that. It, ma it makes me think even more that there's, there's a problem. In a statement, the East Kent Hospitals Trust said that following detailed testing and analysis, there was insufficient evidence to determine if the infection originated from the same source. They added that the surgeon had told them that he had no hand lesions or history of the virus. The women's babies both survived. Their families now want inquests into the deaths. Michael Buchanan, BBC News, Kent. The latest government coronavirus figures now, and in the last 24 hours, there have been nearly 45,000 new infections recorded. That's just over 5,000 more than this time last week. On average, there were nearly 42,000 new cases reported per day in the past week. 45 deaths were recorded. That's of people who died within 28 days of a positive COVID-19 test. On average, in the past week, 147 related deaths were recorded every day. And on vaccinations, 15.3 million people have now had their booster injection. The time is coming up to 20 past six, our top story this evening. MPs prepare to vote on the Prime Minister's social care plans in England. Labour calls them daylight robbery. And still to come, we report from Wisconsin, where police are questioning the driver of a vehicle which ploughed into a Christmas parade, killing five people. Coming up in Sports Day in the next 15 minutes on the BBC News Channel, we're going to hear from the British trampolinist Bryony Page, who's capped a brilliant year by becoming world champion for the first time. A private investigator has been describing the lengths he says he went to around 15 years ago to get information about Prince Harry and his then-girlfriend, Chelsea Davy. Speaking for the first time, Gavin Burrows has told the BBC that he targeted her voicemails for a newspaper. Prince Harry is part of a group involved in ongoing legal action against the News of the World and The Sun that could culminate in a trial. The private investigator is a witness in the legal case. His claims have yet to be heard in court and are strongly disputed by the publisher of both papers. Newsgroup Newspapers has, though, previously accepted that some unlawful activity did occur at the News of the World, but denies wrongdoing at The Sun. Here's our media editor, Amal Rajan, and a warning his report contains some flashing images. What's termed or referred to as the invisible contract behind closed doors. Uh, between the institution and the tabloids. The Duke of Sussex regularly speaks out about what he sees as the ills of modern media. His difficult relationship with the press goes back to his youth and the culture of tabloids in the mid-2000s, when subjects of interest to them included his then-girlfriend, Chelsea Davy. 
Harry had basically become the new Diana. This private investigator is a witness in legal cases against the News of the World and the Sun brought by Prince Harry and others, which claim Harry became a victim of media intrusion from his teens. The Duke is also taking legal action against Mirror Group newspapers. Gavin Burrows says he targeted Davy for the News of the World. There was a lot of voicemail hacking going on. There was a lot of surveillance went on on Chelsea Davy, on her phones, on the comms. Chelsea would brag to her friends when she was going to see him. And so her life became an object of obsession for you guys as well? Yeah. Medical records, had she had an abortion, sexual diseases, ex-boyfriends, vet them, check them. Because I basically uh, was part of a group of people that robbed him of his uh, normal teenage years. Good to meet you. How are you? The lawyer representing the group of litigants, which includes Prince Harry, says that while most victims of hacking have settled, some have not. Certain claimants want to have their day in court and want to see there be a trial so that the newspapers are held to account for what they did. Meghan Markle's privacy case against the Mail on Sunday has generated plenty of recent headlines. But her husband's ongoing legal battle could be an even bigger moment. How big a moment in British public life do you think it could be if Prince Harry gets his day in court, as he seems to want? I think it'll be massive, because it's very striking, isn't it, that he is, keeps going. All the other people up until now have, have settled a financial settlement with no admission of guilt on any side. Over a thousand people have settled. Over a thousand people have settled, and there's a few who haven't. And Prince Harry's one of those yeah, who he hasn't. doesn't want to be a thousand and one. Prince Harry says he wants reform of the media. This ongoing case, which could culminate in a trial, shows he intends to use the law as one tool to achieve his ends. Amol Rajan, BBC News. And the princes and the press will be on BBC Two at nine o'clock tonight and available on the BBC iPlayer. Police in the US state of Wisconsin are holding the driver of a vehicle which ploughed into a Christmas parade, killing at least five people and injuring dozens more. The vehicle drove through the back of a marching band. The local hospital says it has treated 18 children among the injured. Well, let's talk to our correspondent, Barbara Pletasha, who is there for us now with the latest. Barbara. We're expecting a police update shortly, Sophie, but the suspect has been named. He is Daryl Brooks. He's a 39 years old, an African-American man who appears to have a lengthy criminal history. Uh, and online court documents show that he had recently been charged on several counts of reckless endangerment and had been released on bail uh, on Friday, or at least a man with the same name and birth date as Daryl Brooks. Uh, he also appears to have been a, a, an aspiring rap artist. He had posted on his Twitter feed a rap video which included what looks like an image of the red sports utility vehicle that was used in the hit and run. We still don't know what the motive was, although U.S. media are suggesting it may have been linked to a previous altercation with a knife. But at what devastating cost? The victims were elderly, the victims were children, 10 of them are still in critical care. And here on Main Street, uh, the police just in the last hour re removed the barriers, but businesses are closed, schools are closed, the community just still really absorbing the shock and the loss. Barbara Pletasha with the latest there, thank you. Scotland's First Minister Nicola Sturgeon and the leader of the Scottish Conservatives have been on a joint visit to a drugs recovery group in a united effort to tackle Scotland's substance abuse death toll. The most recent figures show a record number of drug-related deaths in Scotland for the seventh year in a row. More than 1,300 people died. Scotland has by far the highest drug death rate recorded by any country in Europe. Our Scotland editor, Sarah Smith, reports. Drug abuse is killing more than 25 people a week in Scotland and ruining the lives of many, many more. The figures are the worst in Europe. Were you worried Ryan would end up in a long prison spell? Yeah, aye. Either prison or to take his own life, that's it. John's son struggled with life-threatening drug addiction for years, in trouble with the law, yet the family couldn't access rehab treatment until a charity, the Amy Winehouse Foundation, volunteered to pay for it. He was begging for help. It was really frustrating. So um, I, my, I was trying to break it down to them and say, surely it costs less to put somebody into treatment than it does into prison. We're in treatment, they might have a chance to turn their life about. Ryan is now in recovery and has a full-time job. 
the dire drugs problem has united the First Minister and the Scottish Conservative leader at a drug recovery facility. But cross-party cooperation isn't easy. Meeting with former addicts, Douglas Ross and Nicola Sturgeon agree urgent action is required. In a policy U-turn, the Tory leader says he may now support an official consumption facility that would allow people to use illegal Class A drugs under supervision. There is a united effort to deal with this national scandal. The fact that so many lives are being lost means there's no one got a monopoly on the solutions to this. We can come together from different political sides to come up with a solution that can really make a difference. Drugs charities have long advocated that there should be a right to recovery. And now the Scottish Tories are proposing a new law that would give a legal right to treatment for any addicts who need it. Nicola Sturgeon says she is open to all ideas, including those proposals from the Conservatives, as she admits the problem's drastic. I think the drugs death toll is unacceptable. I think it is shameful. I think we've got to turn it around. So I'm choosing not to be defensive about this. I'm choosing to be candid and say we've got to do much better. I've got to do much better. My government's got to do much better. And there's a serious determination to do that. Boxing lessons are part of the recovery programme at this community centre. It's what all parties say they want to see more of and may be prepared to set aside the usual political punch-ups to try and make it happen. Sarah Smith, BBC News, Glasgow. Details have emerged about why the double child killer Colin Pitchfork was recalled to prison two months after being released following a controversial decision by the parole board. Concerns were raised after he repeatedly approached young women in the street and it's understood that he tried to, to cheat on lie detector tests he had to take as part of his parole conditions. His recall is understood to have been as a preventative measure. The biggest awards ceremony in British music, the Brits, has decided to scrap categories for different genders. It will no longer give out prizes for best male or best female, but instead choose one artist of the year. The Brit award-winning singer Sam Smith, who identifies as non-binary, has campaigned for the change. He says he felt unable to enter last year because of the gender-based nature of the categories. Hundreds of people have lined the streets of Southend in Essex to pay their respects to the local MP Sir David Amos, who was stabbed to death last month. A memorial service was held today ahead of his funeral at Westminster Cathedral tomorrow. From Southend, here's Daniela Ralph. He died working for the people he served. Today, they came to say goodbye. Oh. Sir David Amos's coffin was borne by Southend firefighters. The streets were filled with his constituents and local sea scouts lined the path into church. As a place he'd served for almost 40 years, said farewell. My son's actually in the third Chalkwell Bay. Sea Scouts. He's one of the Sea Scouts outside. That have come to represent. So yeah, it's just a really sad day. It's touched a lot of people, whether they're into the same politics or not. Mm. Took my grandson out of school today, this afternoon, so that he could also come pay respects as well. Everything felt local. The sound of the church service was broadcast on BBC Radio Essex. And friend and former Conservative MP Anne Widdicombe spoke on behalf of Sir David's wife and children. As a family, we are trying to understand why this awful thing has occurred. Nobody should die in that way. Please let some good come from this tragedy. His final journey through South End took him past his constituency office and the Civic Centre. The funeral mass will be in the grandeur of Westminster Cathedral tomorrow. But as it so often did for Sir David Amos, Essex came first. Daniel Ralph, BBC News, Southend. Time now for a look at the weather. Here is Nick Miller. Hello. Hi there. It felt chilly today, but there was actually plenty of blue sky around. It's given us a glorious sunset out there today. But get ready for a couple of cloudier days now. In fact, looking at the satellite picture, we've already seen the cloud filtering in across Scotland and Northern Ireland so far today, and it's about to move its way further south. It's coming around an area of high pressure. Here it is. So still plenty of dry weather for the next couple of days. Little less chilly air coming in with the cloud, but then again, I'm not sure it's going to feel too different because we're exchanging the sun 
sunshine for the cloudier skies. So with the cloud tonight in Scotland and Northern Ireland, we're avoiding a frost and into northwest England and North Wales, the cloud will also increase and from it you could see a little light rain and drizzle. The clearest skies elsewhere in England and South Wales will allow for another frost going into the morning and there could be a few mist and fog patches around as well as we start the day. So it is going to be a cloudier day tomorrow and from that cloud across Northern and Western Scotland, Northern Ireland, Northwest England, North Wales, you could encounter a little light rain or drizzle. The odd shower clipping the North Sea coast far southeast of England into the Channel Islands, still some sunny spells in South Wales and Southern England, and on the whole, a lot of dry weather out there with temperatures close to average for the time of year. Even more cloud overnight and into Wednesday, so we're not expecting much in the way of frost to start Wednesday morning. And notice the band of wet weather towards the far northwest. That's the weather front moving south across Scotland and Northern Ireland on Wednesday with some rain. As it clears southwards going into Thursday, we're back into the colder air at this stage. But then again, it's going to be a drier, brighter day. And then another change at the end of the week by Friday. Low pressure is going to be right across us. So that is going to give us some wetter weather and a stronger wind. And with temperatures like this, if you haven't yet reached for the big coat, you may be tested by Friday, particularly in that strong, cold wind by then. Sophie. Nick, thank you. And that is all from the BBC News at 6. It's goodbye from me on BBC One. We join the BBC's news teams where you are. Goodbye.